If you're anything like me, the recent reveal of Sora by the makers of ChatGPT might have seriously freaked you out when it comes to the future of filmmaking. You've probably heard all about it by now, but if you haven't, Sora is an AI video image generator that can create extremely realistic 4K video clips based only on text descriptions, and it's gonna be massively disrupting and almost for sure damaging a lot of people out there trying to hustle up a living from filmmaking. So I started to wonder, if we're all about to get replaced by AI, why are we bothering to invest in professional gear and learning how to tell stories? Is it all just a waste of time? And after thinking about this pretty much every day for almost a month now, I've decided that the answer is both yes and no. And in this video, we're gonna talk about what that means, what parts of the documentary film industry are gonna be hardest hit, and how you can put yourself in the best position to survive the coming chaos. So filmmaking, or anything in the arts really, has never really been a secure, stable way to make a living. My dad was a freelance screenwriter, and he wrote for TV and movies almost his entire career, and from what I can remember, there was never really a time when everything was just easy. Sure, there were times, or years even, when things went really well, but there was always an undercurrent of who knows when the next thing will come. So for me, when I went into photography and then later filmmaking, I think I did it with a pretty good awareness of what I was getting into. But what I've seen in the last month or so, first with the release of the Vision Pro headsets from Apple and then the tech videos about Sora, this is a whole other level of threat to the future of filmmaking. Actually, maybe I should say the future of filmmakers, not filmmaking, because I think regardless of whether or not you and I have a job, films will continue to be made. We just might not recognize how they're made. I've been thinking about this stuff on and off for a while now, but after watching MKBHD's video on Sora, I think this is coming a lot faster than I first thought. And if you're a bit earlier on in your career and worried about whether or not you're wasting your time getting into a field that might be AI dominated by the end of the decade, if not sooner, I hear you. These are really valid concerns. So I'm gonna get into exactly how I see the landscape for filmmakers changing in the short and long term in just one second. But just in case you're not following, I should just quickly explain what Sora is, I guess. To be honest, I hadn't heard anything about Sora before MKBHD released a video about it last month, and I'll link to that below because it's really worth watching. And shout out to MKBHD for just having amazing takes on not just tech stuff, but all the philosophical implications too. But the gist is that OpenAI, the company that makes ChatGPT, is in the early testing phases with their new app, Sora, which can create 100% AI-generated videos with only text inputs. I won't go much deeper into the tech than that, just watch MKBHD's video for all the details, but all we really need to know here is that the results are good, like scary good. And considering that this is the worst this tech is ever gonna be, it's terrifying. In the video, we can see extremely realistic, high-quality slow-mo footage generated from just text prompts, so like, woman in leather jacket walking through Tokyo at night. When you look really closely at the details, there is all sorts of uncanny valley stuff going on, so it's not perfect, but for something that hasn't even been released yet, it's closer to perfect than I would have ever imagined it could be. Just give it a couple years and it will be perfect. At least, I think we should all just assume it will be perfect to avoid getting caught off guard. So what does this mean for us and what changes are coming? Well, I won't sugarcoat it. I think there are gonna be some massive changes and they're coming very soon. And I don't think I'm the only one because the Daily Wire reported recently that Tyler Perry, who no matter what you think of his movies, has to be one of the most driven and entrepreneurial people in the whole film industry. He just stopped construction on an $800 million studio expansion after seeing the Sora demo. So right off the bat, I think we should be operating on the assumption that within five years, it will be more or less impossible to earn money from stock sales, unless the footage is of a specific and important real world event that can't be repeated. But everything else, all the sunset drone shots of city skylines, the famous landmarks at dusk, the slow-mo textures of water, macro details of nature, all that stuff that has been making money on stock websites for a while now, I think it's all gone, or at least it will be so easy to make that it's not gonna be a viable source of revenue. Instead of looking through Pond5 or whatever, when a company needs a generic illustrative shot, it's gonna be so much cheaper just to have a license to Sora and generate what they need on a case-by-case -case basis in a couple of seconds. And honestly, it's probably gonna be even better than even the best stock because you're just gonna be able to continuously generate and regenerate new clips until you get exactly what you want for your ad or presentation or whatever. Pretty grim prognosis to start, I know, but I personally think pretending otherwise would be kind of like hiding your head in the sand and hoping for the best. 
All right, so stock is out, but what else? Well, I think the bottom end of the market in general, by which I mean the really small jobs that have traditionally been sources of income for early career filmmakers, a bunch of them are also gonna disappear fast. And here I'm talking about those one day drone shoots or the B-roll assignments of a local landmark, the kind that I used to get all the time back in the day that helped keep me afloat. I just can't see these things being around for much longer. Like if I need some visuals of the historic center of Mexico City for a low budget film, which is a real example of the kinds of assignments I used to get a few times a year when I was living there, rather than hire a freelancer, it's going to be so much easier and cheaper just to generate it. Again, pretty brutal sounding, but I want to call it like I see it. Lower end editing jobs are also probably on the chopping block before too long, but that's sort of beyond the scope of this video, so I won't go too deep there. But the theme here is that it's the small jobs that are going to go first, the ones where budget was already an issue and price is more important than top-notch quality. And if you're just starting to get your foot in the door, a lot of people need those jobs to stay in business while they work on breaking through to the next level. Now up to this point, I know everything I'm saying sounds like a filmmaking apocalypse, and in some senses it might be exactly that. I mean, Tyler Perry is risking almost a billion dollars on the assumption that the changes are coming, so just let's all think about that. Personally, I think it's easy to extrapolate a future in which we're all hooked up to Vision Pro headsets, watching completely bespoke, personalized movies that were created specifically for us based on actors we like, our favorite genres, and our general interests. And I think it's probably coming sooner than we think because as MKBHD points out, just 12 months ago, the very best that AI could do was that crazy footage of Will Smith eating spaghetti that may or may not give me nightmares. And now it's spitting out videos so good that I have trouble telling what's fake. And again, it's still in beta testing. It hasn't even been released. So why then am I committing more and more to documentary filmmaking instead of making plans to get off this ship as fast as possible? Well, for that, we need to look at the story of one of the greatest frauds in the history of Canadian music. If you're not from Canada, you might not have heard of Buffy St. Marie, but for more than half a century, she was a successful musician and one of the country's most prominent indigenous rights figures. She claimed Cree ancestry and she was so well known that she guest starred on Sesame Street multiple times and she was like a national celebrity in some ways. But Buffy wasn't exactly what she seen because last year it was exposed that actually she'd been lying the entire time and she was actually from Massachusetts. Her own family even called her out for being a fraud and said they didn't understand where she'd come up with this story because she wasn't Cree at all. She was Italian American. So if you had to guess, do you think people were okay with this revelation? Maybe even understanding of the lies because she'd done so much good in the past? No, of course not. People were furious and she was outed publicly in her 80s on the largest scale imaginable with like massive multimedia features and full podcast series all investigating her lies. But you're probably wondering what on earth this has to do with filmmaking. Well, quite a bit in my opinion, because I think that's exactly how people are gonna feel about a lot of AI generated content. Now, I'm not gonna pretend that the idea of watching a custom movie starring all my favorite actors doesn't sound like fun. And if it comes to Hollywood, I'd definitely be down to try it. And so would pretty much everyone else, I'm guessing. Fictional stories made just for me sounds pretty cool, honestly. And here I can see why Tyler Perry freaked out. But real stories, well told, fill a different role in entertainment and they hit audiences a little differently. People in general, like being inspired by other humans. They want to see ordinary people do incredible things and understand more about how the world works through their perspective so that they can imagine themselves succeeding against adversity in their own real lives. And I just don't see how this can be replicated by AI. Sure, AI could provide stunning B-roll, it could generate insane computer graphics and effects, and it could even maybe edit it together. But how can a computer find a powerful story in the real world, generate contacts with those real people, and then get out and actually capture it. I just don't see it. At least not until we strap cameras on the back of those weird Boston Dynamics robots anyways. And if you did turn over control of doc filmmaking to an AI and the audience found out, I'd imagine they'd feel a lot like Canadians felt when they found out Buffy St. Marie had been lying all those years. Hurt, confused, and probably angry. I would even argue that as AI-generated art becomes more and more mainstream, there's gonna be an even bigger demand for real stories in the future as people start to get increasingly desperate to be engaged with real-world events. That's why, even though I think that the traditional distribution models are going through an extremely rough patch, and it's already been extremely hard to sell docs to Netflix and Amazon and any of the big players lately, but it's still probably one of the safest sectors of the filmmaking industry for the long term, at least in my opinion. 
opinion. The faker things get in the world, the more people are going to look for things that are still real, and real can't be faked without making people seriously mad. But even so, that doesn't mean that you can just keep doing the same things and expect everything to work out because the filmmakers who succeed in this new era are going to have to adapt, and I'm speaking from personal experience here. For the record, I got into photojournalism probably at one of the worst times in the history of the business. It was right after the digital camera revolution and the internet sort of collided to blow apart the business model of the news industry, and overnight there was an explosion of people with really high-end camera gear in their hands who were hungry to document the world. I was one of them. At the same time, the people who were willing to pay for it, the news outlets, they're all losing money left and right, and so it became a race to the bottom for freelancers getting paid. Now at the time, I worked like a maniac for years to get to the point where I was shooting assignments for the New York Times, and by most metrics, I was living my dream. But even then, and here I'm talking about like 10 plus years ago, I could see that for most people, photojournalism was going to stop being a middle class job very soon. Rates were down, there was an abundance of talent, and there was no sign any of that was going to get better. So even though all I'd wanted to do for years was shoot documentary stills professionally, I started expanding my skill set by learning video. It took me years to transition fully, and it wasn't even something I really wanted at the time, but I knew I had to adapt or die. And when I look back at my colleagues who refused to change and just insisted on doing the job like it had always been done before, and where they are now, well, things haven't really been easy for most of them. Not that I'm saying they've been easy for me, that's not it, but by adapting to the trends and staying flexible with my skills, I've managed to stay in the documentary business more broadly for my entire adult life. Because let's face it, the world owes you nothing, and thinking that you can do exactly what you want and thrive just isn't true most of the time. So who knows what's coming? Maybe it's Sora, maybe it's something else we've never heard of yet, but we need to figure out how to embrace the tools of the future and harness their power as force multipliers for our own work. Like for me personally, I I've found a bunch of ways to use ChatGPT as a writing and planning tool, and it's helped me be so much more productive than ever. Then it's honestly a big part of the reason why I'm able to put out weekly content while still traveling as a professional documentary cinematographer for almost half of last year. And it's not just ChatGPT these days, like Audio, the sponsor of this video, made a tool called Link Match AI that's totally changed the way I search for my music to score my projects and YouTube videos. Like basically, it allows you to input links to famous pop songs and it gives you back a link to a bunch of royalty free tracks so that you can find a song that matches the vibe you had in mind without getting sued. Like let's say I heard, I don't know, the song Blinding Lights by The Weeknd on the radio or something and I thought this would be the perfect song for that scene or video that I've been making but there's just no way I'll get the rights to that song on my budget. Now, normally you'd have to go to a royalty free music site and then filter the catalog through a bunch of keywords and it can be sort of hard to know how to explain something. At least I find it hard. Like what is that song exactly? Is it cinematic? and excited or cheerful electronic? Linkmatch makes this way easier by just allowing you to paste the link from YouTube or Spotify or whatever right into the search bar and then it gives you back the best results super fast. I found a bunch of great songs really quickly this way and it's exactly the kind of tool that can make you a more productive filmmaker by leveraging new tech. You can get access to Linkmatch through an audio pro plan which is still only 59 bucks for a full year subscription if you use the link and code in the description and it's hands down the best value music service out there in my opinion. Sorry for the plug but I think it's pretty relevant here. But whether or not you're interested in ChatGPT or LinkMatch or any other tech for that matter, if you're like those old school photographers I knew who refused to change with the times, you're gonna get left behind because it's all well and good to stay true to your vision for what the market is supposed to want according to the rules of the past and I do respect that stance, but the world doesn't care and it's gonna want what it wants regardless of how you want things to be. It's harsh but true. Okay, so maybe you've already accepted the inevitability of these new tools and you're prepared to roll with the times. What skills are gonna be the most in demand moving forwards and how are you gonna make yourself hard to replace? Well, the answer isn't to build up show reels of slow motion boxing gym footage and drone shots at sunset because those things will be really easy for AI to replicate and the value of pretty footage is gonna go way down. Which I'm actually sort of okay with because people have been mistaking a collection of nice shots with documentaries for years now and I think it's time for a change. And just to make my point, let's compare two AI models and then you can tell me which type of filmmaker you think is gonna survive the next decade. First, let's think about the standard customer service chatbot like you'd find 
find on a lot of commercial websites these days. The Passport Canada office has a particularly infuriating virtual assistant that I've come to hate with a special passion. These are the AIs where you ask specific questions and it comes back at you with what's essentially an extended FAQ list of responses. And usually these only help you if you ask very specific questions. Like if my situation is so cut and dry and all I need is general information though, I can just find that with a Google search. And by the time my issue is complex enough to start looking for someone to talk to, nine times out of 10, the AI can't help and I end up calling to speak to a human agent. On the other hand, let's look at ChatGPT. True, ChatGPT can't get me a new passport in Botswana any more than the AI assistant can. But when I ask it questions, it gives me vibrant and custom responses based on the past collective experiences of the internet. It's responsive. So like, let's say I wanted to understand how to make better YouTube videos based on what content is doing well for other creators. I can just copy in a ton of raw data and say, analyze these videos and tell me what topics and themes have been of interest to this creator's audience. It's going to churn for a second and then it'll give me something genuinely quite useful most of the time. Now I know comparing AI to AI might seem like a weird analogy, but this is kind of how filmmakers need to be thinking too. Setting up some tube lights with a haze machine and filming a boxer in 120 frames a second looks cool, really cool even, and I totally get why people like to use their gear on stuff like this. But this is not a story, and with the incredible cameras and tech we have access to these days, it's sort of the filmmaking equivalent to a technical demonstration. Now if you've shot that scene before, I'm not trying to put you down, it's a great way to practice, but I'm just trying to make a point here. Now let's think about another type of filmmaker, and in comparison, this one gets to know the boxer, they follow them around for a sustained period of time, both in the gym and at home, maybe even they go to some of their family events, and over the course of time, they start to capture the boxer's motivations for fighting, what drives them, what they hope to accomplish, and then with that backstory, the audiences watch nervously as they put it all on the line in their first pro fight. Like, viewers then are gonna flinch whenever our hero takes a punch, and they'll feel emotionally relieved when it's all over. That is a story, and the filmmakers who can tell stories are the ones who are gonna be in demand in an AI world. Look, it's really hard for any of us to know what's gonna happen here, and it's entirely possible that everything I've said is gonna turn out to be wrong. Or maybe Sora will be a giant flop, and the tech that really disrupts the film industry is gonna be something new that hasn't even been invented yet. If we could predict the future, then life would have no meaning. But to pretend that filmmaking is just gonna keep going the way it always has is really risky in my opinion. Change is coming, but if your long-term motivation is to tell stories about the world around you and you're flexible enough to learn new tools and workflows, then I think the future is actually pretty bright. I'm still all in anyways, and that's not changing anytime soon. See ya.